Section 15 of Famous Impostors. Famous Impostors by Bram Stoker. Chapter 10. The Bisley Boy. Part 3. H. The Solution. The Duke of Richmond. The points which must be settled before we can solve the mystery of the Bisley Boy are 1. Was there such an episode regarding the early life of the Princess Elizabeth? 2. Was there such a boy as was spoken of? 3. How could such an imposture have been carried out, implying as it did? a. A likeness to the princess so extraordinary as not to have created suspicion in the mind of anyone not already in the plot. b. An acquaintance with the circumstances of the life of the princess sufficiently accurate to ward off incipient suspicion caused by any overlooking or neglect of necessary conditions. c. An amount of education and knowledge equal to that held by a child of 10 to 12 years of age who had been taught by some of the most learned persons of the time. d. A skill in classics and foreign tongues only known amongst high scholars and diplomatists. e. An ease of body and a courtliness of manner and bearing utterly foreign to any not bred in the higher circles of social life. If there could be found a boy answering such conditions, one whose assistance could be had with facility and safety, then the solution is possible even if not susceptible of the fullest proof. Following the lines of argument hitherto used in this book, let us first consider reasons why such an argument is tenable. I may then perhaps be allowed to launch the theory which has come to me during this investigation. A. His birth and appearance. A part, and no small part, of the bitterness of Henry VIII in not having a son to succeed him was that, though he had a son, such could not, by the existing law, succeed him on the throne. Nearly ten years after his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and after a son and other children had been born to them, all of whom had died shortly after birth, Henry had in the manner of medieval kings, and others, entered on a love affair, the object of his illicit affection being one of the ladies-in-waiting to Queen Catherine, Elizabeth, daughter of John Blount of Nevet, Shropshire. The story of this love affair is thus given in quaint old English in Grafton's Chronicle, first published in 1569, which covers the period from 1189 to 1558. Quote, you shall understand, the king in his fresh youth was in the chains of love with a fair demoiselle called Elizabeth Blunt, daughter of Sir John Blunt, knight, which demoiselle in singing, dancing, and in all goodly pastimes excelled all other, by the which goodly pastimes she won the king's heart, and she again showed him such favour that by him she bare a goodly man-child of beauty like to the father and mother. This child was well brought up like a princess child. End quote. B. His upbringing and marriage. This son of an unlawful union, born in 1519, it is said, we called Henry Fitzroy, after the custom applicable in such cases to the natural children of kings. Naturally enough, his royal father took the greatest interest in this child, and did, whilst the latter lived, all in his power to further his interests. A mere list of the honours conferred on him during his short life will afford some clue to the king's intention of his further advancement, should occasion serve. The shower of favours began in 1525, when the child, as is said, was only six years of age. On the 18th of June of this year, he was created Earl of Nottingham and Duke of Richmond and Somerset, with precedence over all dukes except those of the king's lawful issue. He was also made a Knight of the Garter, of which exalted order he was raised to the lieutenancy eight years later. He was also nominated to other high offices, the king's lieutenant-general for districts north of the Trent, and keeper of the city and fortress of Carlisle. To these posts were added those of Lord High Admiral of England, Wales, Ireland, Normandy, Gascony and Aquitaine, warden-general of the marches of Scotland, and receiver of Middleham, and of Sheriff Hutton, Yorkshire. He was also given an income of £4,000 sterling per annum. 
in 1529, being then only ten years of age, he was also made Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Constable of Dover Castle, and Warden of the Cinque Ports, three of the most important officers of the nation. A few months before his death in 1536, there was a general understanding that Henry VIII intended to make him King of Ireland, and possibly to nominate him as his successor on the throne of England. That some such intention was in Henry's mind was shown by the Succession Act, passed just before the close of the Parliament, which was dissolved in 1536. In this Act, it is fixed that the crown is to devolve on the king's death to the son of Jane Seymour, and in default of issue by him, on Mary and Elizabeth in succession, in case of lack of issue by the former. In the event of their both dying before the king and without issue, he is to appoint by will his successor on the throne. The various important posts conferred on the young Duke of Richmond were evidently preparations for the highest post of all, which in default of legitimate issue of his own legitimate children he intended to confer on him. The education which was given to the little Duke is of a special interest and ought in the present connection to be carefully studied. It was under the care of Richard Croke, celebrated for his scholarship, who in the modern branch was assisted by John Palsgrave, the author of the earliest English grammar of the French language, L'Esclarissement de la Langue Françoise. In spite of the opposition of his household, the Duke of Richmond devoted his young life to study rather than to arms. Whilst still a young boy, he had already read a part of Caesar, Virgil and Terence, knew a little Greek and was fairly skilful in music singing and playing on the virginals. There was much talk in court circles as to whom he should marry, and many ladies of high degree were named. One was a niece of Pope Clement VII, another was a Danish princess, still another a princess of France, also a daughter of Eleanor, dowager queen of Portugal, a sister of Charles V. This lady was afterwards queen of France. Early in 1532, the Duke resided for a while at Hatfield. Then he went to Paris with his friend the Earl of Surrey, son of the Duke of Norfolk. There he remained till September 1533. On his return to England, he married by special dispensation on 25th of November 1533, Mary Howard, daughter of the Duke of Norfolk, by his second marriage and sister of Surrey. Incidentally, he is said to have been present at the beheading of Queen Anne Boleyn, May 19, 1536. He did not long survive the last-named exhibition, for some two months later, 22nd July, 1536, he died. There was at the time the suspicion that he had been poisoned by Lord Rochford, brother of Queen Anne Boleyn. Henry, Duke of Richmond and Somerset, had no legal issue. As a matter of fact, though he was married in 1533, nearly three years before his death, he never lived with his wife. It was said that he was not only young for matrimony, being only seventeen, but was in very bad health. It was intended that after his marriage he should go to Ireland, but on account of the state of his health that journey was postponed, as it turned out, forever. A light on this ill-starred marriage is thrown in the quaint words of another chronicler of the time, Charles Wrightesley, who wrote at the time between 1485 and 1559. Quote, but the said young duke had never lain by his wife, and so she is maid, wife, and now a widow. I pray God send her now good fortune. End quote. In this summarized history, certain points are to be noticed. 1. The Duke of Richmond was, like his father, Henry VIII, and his mother, who was fair. 2. A dispensation was obtained for his marriage to Lady Mary Howard, which took place in 1533, but with whom he never cohabited. There is a sidelight here of the hereditary aspect of the case. Both the Duke and Duchess of Richmond were fair, and in the language of the old chroniclers, fair means blonde. Winton, for instance, speaking of Macbeth's supposed descent from the devil, says, quote, Gotten he was unfairly wise, his mother to what is mad often to repair, for the delight of hailsome air. Soit show passed upon a day, 
Tell a wad here for to play, show met at case with a fair man. End quote. And Grafton thus speaks under date 7 September 1533 of Elizabeth's birth, quote, The Queen was delivered of a fair lady. End quote. Now, Anne Boleyn is described as small and lively, brunette with black hair and beautiful eyes, and yet her daughter is given as red haired by all the painters. It is somewhat difficult to make out the true colours of persons. For instance, Giovanni Michiel, writing to the Venetian Senate in 1557, puts in his description of Elizabeth, quote, She is tall and well formed, with a good skin, although swarthy. End quote. But in the same page he says, quote, She prides herself on her father and glories in him. Everybody is saying that she also resembles him more than the Queen, Mary, does. End quote. As to the introduction of the word swarthy as above, it may have been one of the tricks of Elizabeth to keep the Venetian ambassador from knowing too much or getting any ground for guessing. If so, it looks rather like Elizabeth concealing her real identity, which would be an argument in favour of an imposture. If she was the real princess, there would be no need for concealment. It is only common sense to expect if the paternal element was so strong in Henry as to reproduce in offspring his own colour, that had the Duke of Richmond had any issue, especially by a fair wife, it too would have inherited something of the family colour. Holbein's picture of the Lady of Richmond, as the Duke's wife was called, shows her as a fair woman. These are two points to be here borne in mind, that Henry VIII was probably bold, for in none of his pictures is any hair visible. It would hardly be polite to infer that Elizabeth wore a wig for the same reason, but it is recorded that she always travelled with a stock of them, no less than eighty of various colours. But there are other indications of such concealment. Why, for instance, did she object to see doctors? So long as she was free and could control them, she did not mind, but whilst she was under duress, they were a source of danger. Perhaps it is this which accounts for her taking the sacrament on 26 August 1554, when she was practically a prisoner at Woodstock in the keeping of Sir Henry Beddingfield. About the third week in June, the princess asked Sir Henry to be allowed to have a doctor sent to her. He in turn applied it to the council, who made answer on the 25th that the Queen's Oxford physician was ill, and Mr. Wendy was absent, and the remaining one, Mr. Owen, could not be spared. The letter, however, recommended two Oxford doctors, Barnes and Walbeck, in case she should care to see either of them. On July the 4th, Sir Henry reported to the council that Elizabeth, impolitely declining, said, quote, I am not minded to make any stranger privy to the state of my body, but commit it to God. End quote. Then, when through her submission to the Queen's religious convictions she had obtained her liberty, she took no more concern in the matter. Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, married twice. His second wife was the Lady Elizabeth Stafford, eldest daughter of the Duke of Buckingham, and he had issue by both marriages. In 1533, the only surviving daughter of the second marriage was Mary, who was thus the Lady Mary Howard, sister of the Earl of Surrey. It was this lady with whom the uncompleted marriage of the Duke of Richmond took place. Doubtless they were early friends. In her youth, she used to spend the summer at Tendering Hall, Suffolk, and the winter at Hunsdon, Hertfordshire, where was one of Henry's palaces. In addition, Henry was one of the closest companions of her brother, the Earl of Surrey. Lady Richmond's part in the historical episode before us is hardly direct. It only comes in through two circumstances not unattended with mystery. It is not necessary that the two were correlated but no student can get away from the idea that there was some connection between them, especially when there is another inference bearing on the subject with reference to the second marriage of the Duchess. This took place after an interval of some years to Gilbert, son of Sir George Tallboys of Goloth, Lincolnshire. The name of the second husband is variously spelled in the Chronicles as Tallboys or Talbews. She died in the year before Elizabeth came to the throne, the two things to examine closely with regard to this marriage to the Duke of Richmond were the dispensation for the marriage, together with the date of it, and its non-fulfillment. 
The dispensation was dated 28 November 1533, but the marriage took place three days earlier. Whether this discrepancy had anything to do with her later marriage to tall boys, we can only guess. Unless, of course, more exhaustive search can produce some document, unknown as yet, which may throw light on the subject. It is a matter of no light mystery why a dispensation was obtained at such a time, and by whom it was effected. At this time, Henry VIII was engaged in the bitterest struggle of his life, that regarding the supremacy of the Pope, so that it was a direct violation of his policy to have asked for, or even to recognize, such a dispensation in the case of his own son, whom he intended to succeed him as king. Before a year had passed, he had actually thrown over the papal authority altogether, and had taken into his own hands the headship of the National Church. What, then, was behind such a maladroit action? If it had been done as a piece of statecraft, the ostensible showing that there was as yet no direct rupture between the British nation and the papacy, it would have lost its efficacy if it might be cited as a court favour rather than a national right. Moreover, as it was to sanction, by then existing canonical law, a marriage of Henry's son with the daughter of the head of the most powerful Catholic house in England, it could not be expected that Rome would not use this in its strife for the continuation of its supremacy. If Henry was directly concerned in the matter, it was bad policy and unlike him to conciliate Catholicism by a yielding on the part of one who would be in the future the head of the Reformed Church. Altogether, it leaves one under the impression that there must have been a more personal cause than any yet spoken of. Something to be covered up, or from which suspicion should be averted. There was already quite enough material for a controversy in case Henry Fitzroy should come to the throne, and it might be well to minimize any further risk. But in such case, what was there to be covered up, or from which suspicion should be averted? Already Richmond held under his father all the threats of government in his own hand. If he ever should need to tighten them, it would be done by himself as ruler. There must still be some reason which must be kept secret, and of which Henry himself did not and must not know. Beyond this again was the question of the personal ambition of bluff King Hal. It was not sufficient for him that a barren heir should succeed him even if that heir was his own son. He wanted to found a dynasty, and if he suspected for an instant that after all his plotting and striving, all his titanic efforts to overcome such obstacles as nations and religions, his hopes might fail through lack of issue on his son's part, he would cease to waste his time and efforts on his behalf. It is almost impossible to imagine that the Duke of Richmond had not had some love affairs, if indeed he was only seventeen, of which there is a doubt. It must be borne in mind that both the Lancastrians and the Yorkists, who united in the Tudor stock, matured early. On both his father's and mother's side, Henry Fitzroy was of a pleasure-loving, voluptuous nature, and as the masculine element predominated in his makeup, there is not any great stretch of imagination required to be satisfied that there was some young likeness of him toddling or running about. But in a case like his, masculine misdoing does not count. It is only where a woman's credit is at stake that secrecy is a vital necessity. We must therefore look to the female side to find a cause for any mystery which there may be. So far as a boy of the right age is concerned with a decided likeness to Henry VIII, it would not have required much searching about to lay hands on a suitable one. The Duchess of Richmond but here a new trouble would begin. It would be beyond nature to expect that any mother would consent, especially at a moment's notice, to her child running such a risk as a substitute of the dead Princess Elizabeth was taking, without some kind of assurance or guarantee of his safety. Moreover, if there were other relatives, they would be sure to know, and some of them to make trouble, unless their mouths were closed. Practically the only chance of carrying such an enterprise through would be if the substitute were an orphan, or in a worse position, one whose very life was an embarrassment to those to whom it should be most dear. Here opens a field for romantic speculation. Such need not clash with history, which is a record of fact. Call it romance if we will, 
Indeed, until we have more perfect records, we must. If invention is to be called in to the aid of deduction, no one can complain if these two methods of exercise of intellect are kept apart and the boundaries between them are duly charted. Any speculation beyond this can be only regarded as belonging to the region of pure fiction. In one way there is a duty which the reader must not shirk, if only on his own account, not to refuse to accept facts without due consideration. Wildly improbable as the Bisley story is, it is not impossible. Whoever says offhand that such a story is untrue on the face of it ought to study the account of a death reported at Colchester in Essex just a hundred years ago. A servant died who had been in the same situation as housemaid and nurse for thirty years, but only after death was the true sex of the apparent woman discovered. It was masculine. Here I must remind such readers as honour my work with their attention that I am venturing merely to tell a tradition sanctioned by long time, and that I only give as comments historical facts which may be tested by any student. I have invented and shall invent nothing, and only claim the same right which I have in common with everyone else, that of forming my own opinion. Here it is that we may consider certain additions to the original Bisley tradition. How these are connected with the main story is impossible to say after the lapse of centuries, but in all probability there is a basis of ancient belief in all that has been added. The following items cover the additional ground. When the governess wished to hide the secret hurriedly, she hid the body, intending it to be only temporarily, in the stone coffin which lay in the garden at Overcourt outside the princess's window. Some tens of years ago, the bones of a young girl lying amidst rags of fine clothing were found in the stone coffin. The finder was a churchman, a man of the highest character and a member of a celebrated ecclesiastical family. The said finder firmly believed in the story of the Bisley boy. Before Elizabeth came to the throne, all those who knew the secret of the substitution were in some way got rid of or their silence assured. The name of the substituted youth was Neville, or such was the name of the family with whom he was living at the time. There are several persons in the neighbourhood of Bisley who accept the general truth of the story, even if some of the minor details appear at first glance to be inharmonious. These persons are not of the ordinary class of gossipers, but men and women of light and leading, who have fixed places in the great world and in the social life of their own neighbourhood. With some of them, the truth of the story is an old belief which makes a tie with any new investigator. The Unfulfilled Marriage The remaining point to touch on is the unfulfilled marriage of the Duke of Richmond. This certainly needs some explanation, or else the mystery remains dark as ever. Here we have two young persons of more than fair presence, and graced with all the endearing qualities that the mind as well as the eye can grasp. We have the assurance of chronicles regarding Henry Fitzroy, and from Holbein's picture we can judge for ourselves of the lady's merits. They are both well-to-do. The lady, one of title, daughter of one of the most prominent dukes in England. The man, then holding many of the most important posts in the state, and with every expectation of wearing in due course the purple of royalty. They both come of families of which other members have been notorious for amatory episodes. Voluptuousness is in their blood. They have been old friends, and yet when they marry they at once separate, she going to her own folk and he to Windsor. Seemingly they do not meet again in the two and a half years that elapse before his death. The story about his youth and health preventing cohabitation is all moonshine. The affair points to the likelihood of some antimatrimonial liaison of which as yet we know nothing. Applying the experiences of ordinary life in such cases, we can easily believe that Mary Howard, egged on by her unscrupulous and ambitiously intriguing brother, was for ulterior purposes either forced or helped into an intrigue with the young duke. There is no doubt that Surrey was unscrupulous enough for it. A similar design on his part, only infinitely more base, cost him his head. He had tried to induce his sister, Duchess of Richmond, to become mistress of Henry VIII, her own father-in-law, so that she might have power over him. 
and it does not seem that there was any wonderful indignation on the part of the lady at the shameful proposal. We are told that when Sir John Gates and Sir Richard Southwell, the royal commissioners for examining witnesses in the case of the charge of treason against the Duke of Norfolk and the Earl of Surrey, arrived at Canning Hall in the early morning and made known their general purposes in coming, the Duchess of Richmond almost fainted. But all the same, when she knew more exactly what they wanted, she promised without any forcing to tell all she knew. As a matter of fact, her evidence, with that of Elizabeth Holland, the mistress of the Duke of Norfolk, whilst it helped to get Norfolk off, aided in condemning Surrey. There must have been some other cause for her consternation. She had been bred up in the midst of intrigues, polemical and dynastic, as well as of personal ambition, and was well inured to keeping her countenance, as well as her head, in moments of stress. The cause of her almost fainting must have been something which concerned her even more nearly than either father or brother. It could only have been fear for her child or herself, or for both. It is possible that she dreaded discovery of some sort. Omne ignotum pro magnifico. Suspicion has long, flexible tentacula, with eyes and ears at the end of them, which can penetrate everywhere and see and hear everything. She knew how to dread suspicion and to fear the consequences which must result from inquiry or investigation of any sort. If she had had a child, it must have been kept hidden, and if possible, far away, as the unknown boy was at Bisley. Indeed, the Howards had immense family ramifications, and several of them had collateral relationships in and about Bisley. There were Nevilles there, and doubtless some of them were poor relations, relegated to the faraway place where living was cheap, and where they might augment their tenuous incomes by taking in even poorer relations than themselves, whose rich relatives wished to hide them away. It is only a surmise, but if there had been a case of a child unaccounted for, which any member of so great a family as the Howards wished to keep dark, it would be hard to find a more favourable locality than the little, almost inaccessible hamlet in the Cotswolds. If there were such a child, how easy it would all have been. When the Duke was married, he was fourteen or perhaps sixteen at most, an age which, though over young for fatherhood, in the case of ordinary men, seemed to offer to the Plantagenet York Lancaster blood no absolute difficulty of taking up such responsibility. As Elizabeth was only born some two months before the Duke's marriage, there was not any time to spare, a fact which would doubtless have been used to his advantage if Henry's natural son had lived. In all probability, Richmond's marriage was a part of the plot for aggrandizement of the Howards, which began with the unscrupulous securing by Surrey of the son of Henry VIII at the cost of his sister's honour, and ended with the death of Surrey as a traitor, a doom which his father only escaped by the king dying whilst the act of attainder was lying ready for his signature. If this reasoning be correct, though the data on which it is founded be meagre and without actual proof, as yet, the risk of Duchess Mary's child born before her marriage must have been a terrible hazard. On one side, perhaps, the most powerful sceptre in the world as Gurdon, on the other, death and ruin of the child on which such hopes were built. No wonder, then, that Duchess Mary almost fainted when in the early dawn the King's commissioners conveyed to her the broad object of their coming. No wonder that, freed by larger knowledge from the worst apprehension which could be for her, she announced her willingness to conceal nothing that she knew. That promise could not and would not have been made had the whole range of possibilities, which as yet no one suspected, been opened to their investigation. For even beyond the concern which she felt from the arbitrary power of the king and at the remorseless grip of the law, she had reason to doubt her own kin, the nearest of them, in such a struggle as was going on around them when the whole of the empire, the kingdom of England, France and Spain and the papacy were close to the melting pot. It would have been but a poor lookout for a youth of a little more than a dozen years of age, had fate made in the shuttlecock of such strenuous players who did not hold fair play 
as a primary rule of the game in which they were engaged. In his Life of Elizabeth, Gregorio Letti concludes a panegyric on the Queen's beauty with the following, quote, This was accompanied by such inward qualities that those who knew her were accustomed to say that heaven had given her such rare qualities that she was doubtless reserved for some great work in the world, end quote. The Italian historian perhaps built it better than he knew, for whether the phrase applies to the one who is supposed to have occupied the throne, or one who did so occupy it, it is equally true. The world at that crisis wanted just such a one as Elizabeth. All honour to her, whosoever she may have been, boy or girl, matters not. End of chapter 10, The Bisley Boy. End of section 15. End of Famous Impostors by Bram Stoker.